Hello and welcome back to our study of the fourth servant song in Isaiah and today we are going to look at chapter 52 verse 15 the last verse of the summary before we go into the detail of chapter 53 and God's word reads so shall he sprinkle many nations kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand it's often been quoted that appearances can be deceiving and as the old proverb rightly says don't be deceived by appearance because show is not substance now when you read about the jews perception of a messiah it was steeped in externals their expectation of a messiah was one of pomp and power their messiah their savior was going to be a flamboyant, charismatic leader who would rid them of Roman occupation by flexing his might. Anything less was simply not on their radar. And this is why the Jews scorned Jesus' claims with ridicule and derision, saying things like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Or, is this not the carpenter's son? But this indeed was the Messiah, that they were ridiculing and scorning. But because of their preconceived ide ideas of what a Messiah should look like, they were very misplaced. And as their lives demonstrated, they were more interested in appearance than they were in substance. You see, Jesus didn't look the part. It didn't matter how he interacted with people. It didn't matter that he brought with him a message of real hope. You see, this ordinary man with a simple lifestyle completely blinded them to what real power is, power in a godly character. And because of their misconceptions, they continued to ridicule and scorn Jesus even whilst he hung on the cross, saying things like, he could save others, but look, he can't even save himself. And we're reminded once again of Paul's assessment of the crucifixion, Paul's assessment of a crucified saviour, that it was offensive to Jews and it was nonsense to Gentiles. And it has remained the same ever since. You see, to the modern sanitised mind, it was barbaric. To the sophisticated mind, it's too simple. And this is exactly what Isaiah is prophesying here in verse 15. I want you to look again at the start of verse 15. Read it again. You see, verse 15 is actually a continuation of thought from the previous two verses. And remember, verse numbers only came in around the 13th century and they can sometimes misplace or not allow us to get the flow of the message or the flow of the thought. You see, what Isaiah had began describing in verse 13, it's a whole one big flow right down here to verse 15. And he had began describing Jesus' exaltation. Then his flow leads us into the idea of Christ's humiliation and the idea that the crowd there was dumbfounded and astonished by this disfigured Jesus. But now again, the flow brings us back once more into Christ's exaltation. Now, if you look in the margin of your Bible, you will see that the word sprinkle can also be translated as startle. You see, in the Hebrew language, this word can be mean both um, in various contexts. You see, for the Jew, sprinkle brings to mind a symbolic act of cleansing. And in the Old Testament, you know that blood from an animal had to be shed in order to atone for sin. Sprinkling as well would have brought to the mind of the Jew the image of making a leper cleanse, ceremonially clean, fit once again for normal living and communal worship. And likewise, Jesus' blood shed on the cross cleanses us, rids us of the chains of sin, which made us unfit for communion with God the Father. You see, we were sinners, but God is holy. 
And as Habakkuk 1 and 13 reminds us, the two are completely incompatible. Now, it was once said of Martin Luther that Satan visited him one evening and whispered into his ear, Martin, write all your sins on the wall. You see, there's nothing more that the devil loves doing is to make us feel unworthy. And Luther did that. He got up, apparently, and penned all his sins on this wall. But when he had finished, whilst looking in the eye of the devil, he wrote across all his sins, the blood of Jesus has cleansed me of them. You see, the cross opened up the way to God, which had been closed off to him because of our sin. Think about the opening two verses of Romans chapter 5 for a moment. And there we read, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, we have also obtained access to God. Remember this the next time the devil whispers your unworthiness into your ear and planting the seeds of discontent and doubt and uncertainty in your mind. Remember these two verses because they're filled with certainty and assurance. So this idea of sprinkling of blood, cleansing our sins, does very much come through in what Isaiah is saying here. But what about this idea of the word startle, the translation or the meaning startle, where it says that he will startle many nations and kings' mouths will be stopped? You see, the word startle actually fits really well into the flow of these three verses. Remember what I said earlier back in verse 13, Isaiah was pointing to Christ's exaltation and in verse 14, he was pointing to his humiliation. Well, now once again in verse 15, Isaiah is back looking at Christ's exaltation. Now think about it for a second. The crowds there were first startled, astonished, silenced, dumbfounded by Jesus's humiliation as he stood there, this mass of twisted flesh. But now Isaiah is prophesying that the people will once again be startled, astonished and dumbfounded to learn that this cruel barbaric death was actually always, as I said in our last study, in God's redemptive plan all along. It'll make them amazed that this would be the case. Now wrapped up in that word exaltation, which Isaiah is talking about here, you have the idea of Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, and his intercession. You see, he was raised to life by the Father, and so too will we, those that are his. He was taken to heaven, and so too will we. And he presently sits interceding for us right now at the right hand of the Father. You see, this gospel message of hope, linked with a cross which itself represented no hope, will leave people silenced and amazed when they hear about it. And they'll say things like, it can't be. That's impossible. It's too simple. There must be something more to it than that. Sure, I have done nothing to earn it. Exactly. And as John 1, 1 John 1 and 7 tells us, the cleansing we need can only come from Jesus' sacrifice. You see, there is no other way to the Father except through Jesus. And that's the stumbling block for many. But it's the truth. Yet what I've failed to mention so far is the fact that there's a fourth aspect to that word exaltation. And the fourth aspect that is wrapped up in that word exaltation is the fact that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is on his way. And if people continue to reject and scorn and even put off or ridicule this simple gospel truth that appears just too simple for them, then they definitely will be silenced. 
the moment that the sky unfolds and the trumpet sounds and the cry of the archangel announces Christ's return. His humiliation and ascension was a quiet localised event only witnessed by a few. But his return, that's a cosmic event. Everyone at the exact same time will witness it. We who are his, we will be silenced, but we will be silenced with awe. But those scorners, those rejectors, those putter offers will also be silenced, but not in awe. They'll be silenced with dread when they realise that that simple gospel message that they heard and didn't believe or put off, that was the truth. You see, this teaching of Christ's exaltation here in verse 15, it's the foundation of our hope. In a very real sense, it is why we can face life and death with confidence. It was this simple message that led Paul to proclaim, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Oh, to have the faith of Paul. And as John 4 teaches us, this simple gospel message that dumbfounds so many, it has no racial or ethnic boundaries. The same universal message Jesus and Paul proclaimed is the same each of us must share with others. You see, there's a universal illness of sin that has only got a universal remedy in Christ. His salvation is for all. And as Revelation 7 and 9 teaches us, the redeemed in heaven are from a multitude of nations. We who are his, we will experience that glory. And as Roman 10, 17 tells us, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Once again, you have heard this message of hope. Now cry out to God and claim it.